everyone, and welcome to the Public and Private International Law Research Group and the International Law Association's event this afternoon, the International Criminal Court, the Prosecutor, and Dominic Onguin. We want to thank everyone for joining us in this discussion of a truly landmark case that was decided this past February. This webinar is being recorded and a YouTube link will be circulated afterwards for anyone interested. So to begin, um, I would just like to provide a brief overview of the issues and the crimes that gave rise to this case. The defendant, Ongwen, was a ruthless commander of an armed rebel group, the Lord's Resistance Army, or the LRA, which operated primarily in Northern Uganda, South Sudan, Northeastern Congo, and the Central African Republic. The LRA is a heterodox Christian group that does not have a streamlined political agenda, but instead operates as a violent group that follows its notorious leader, Joseph Kony. The LRA has committed many atrocities, including massacres, torture, rape, pillaging, and forced labor, which has led to the displacement of over 400,000 people in the region. Ongwen served as a key commander of the LRA, who himself was kidnapped as a child and became a child soldier. Troops under his command killed at least 345 civilians and abducted 250 more, including 80 children, during a four-day massacre in 2009. Ongwen surrendered himself in 2015, putting the LRA in a vulnerable position, which is now estimated to have less than 100 soldiers. In 2015, Ongwen made his first appearance, appearance before the pre-trial chamber of the International Criminal Court. And in the six years since, over 4,000 victims were recognized as participants in the case and 69 witnesses and experts have testified for the defense. In February of 2021, the trial chamber found Ongwen guilty of 61 counts of crimes against humanity and war crimes committed in Northern Uganda, specifically murder, torture, enslavement, sexual and gender-based crimes, and conscription and use of child soldiers. He is the first LRA commander to be convicted of these crimes, and it is also the first conviction to include such a wide range of gender-based crimes. It is a unique decision as Ongwen himself was abducted as a child, and therefore he is the first ICC case in which an inductee is being charged with the same crimes that were done against him. The next steps of the case will include the judges imposing a sentence and either side has 30 days to appeal the decision. Today's panelists, Professor Liss and Professor Osterveld will focus on the specificities of the crimes Ongwen was charged with. Firstly, we will hear from Professor Osterveld of Western Law. Her research focus, focuses specifically on gender issues within international criminal justice. She will address the unique gender-based crimes that occurred within the LRA and the charges addressing them brought by the ICC. Secondly, we will hear from Professor List of Western Law. Professor List's research focuses specifically on criminal law, public international law, and human rights. He will address the child soldier aspect of the LRA and this charge of the crime within the ICC. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Piper, for introducing us. As you all heard, on February 4th, there was a significant judgment of the International Criminal Court. The ICC convicted Dominic Ongwen of 61 charges of crimes against humanity and war crimes. And this case is notable for a number of reasons, two of which Professor Liss and I will discuss today. I will discuss the gender-related aspects of the case, and Professor Liss will talk about the child soldier aspects, including the complexity of prosecuting an individual who was a child soldier himself when he was young. But before I talk about the Ongwen judgment, I want to provide some brief, brief background for context about gender-based crimes and the International Criminal Court. The Ongwen trial follows the trial and conviction in July 2019 of Bosco and Daganda, for 18 counts of war crimes and crimes against humanity committed in the Turi Democratic Republic of the Congo in 2002 and 2003. He was sentenced to a total of 30 years of imprisonment and the convictions included crimes of sexual slavery and sexual violence committed against his own troops. Until the Entaganda case in 2019, the ICC's prosecutor had been unsuccessful in securing final convictions for sexual and gender-based crimes. Think about it. This court has been around since 2002, and it wasn't until 2019 that crimes of sexual and gender-based violence had been successfully demonstrated by the prosecutor in terms of final convictions. And as a result, 
the harms flowing from sexual and gender-based crimes and their impact had effectively gone unpunished by the ICC in all of that time. So for example, Germain, Germain Katanga, the former commander of an armed group in the Democratic Republic of the Congo, had been acquitted of all charges related to rape and sexual slavery, even though he was con convicted for other crimes. A majority of the judges concluded in that case that Katanga's contribution reinforced the malicious capacity to implement the attack that was in question in the case. And that it was foreseeable that the militia would murder and attack civilians, but not that it was foreseeable that they would rape or sexually enslave the same civilians. This approach perpetuated an inaccurate perception that rape and sexual slavery somehow require a higher standard of foreseeability than is required of other prohibited acts. Sexual and gender-based crimes were a key defining feature of the decades-long armed conflict between the LRA and the government of Uganda. LRA fighters in Uganda raped, sexually mutilated, and enslaved thousands of women, girls, men, and boys. Women were forced to abandon their babies and children that they had tied to their backs, forced to carry looted goods for the LRA instead of their children. Children were forced into serving as child soldiers. The LRA systematically abducted young women and girls between the ages of 10 and 18 years and distributed them to LRA fighters as so-called bushwives. I say bushwives in, in quotations because of course they were not actually married in law. And they, but they were referred to as wives by the LRA. The girls were simply assigned. The younger girls, girls who were younger than 10, were domestic servants and they were called Ting Ting. Ong Gwen was charged with two types of sexual and gender-based violence. First of all, crimes that he carried out himself, forced marriage, torture, rape, sexual slavery, enslavement, forced pregnancy, and outrages upon personal dignity, committed against seven women who were abducted and placed by him in his household. And secondly, crimes that were carried out by individuals under his command as part of an overarching plan and these charges were forced marriage, torture, rape, sexual slavery, and enslavement committed against girls and women within the brigade that he oversaw called the Sinia Brigade. So let's take a look at these two separate types of charges against Ong Gwen. With respect to the first set of sexual and gender-based violence charges, seven girls from his household testified at trial. Five were his wives, um, two were Ting Tings who were later forced to become his wives. Due to his ongoing rape of his wives, some of them became pregnant and bore children. These girls were also subject to beatings at his command at any time. Some beatings left them unconscious, unable to walk, and they left scars. The seven victims had to perform domestic duties for him. They had to cook, they had to uh, gather food, they had to do laundry, they fetched and chopped wood, they carried his dishes, they fetched his water, they washed him, they nursed him when he was injured, and they took things to him at his request. If the seven victims did not do as he commanded, they were beaten. He also forced his wives to beat other people to death. Ong Gwen was convicted of forced marriage carried out against the five who were wives during the time period at issue in the trial. Now let me talk a little bit about the crime. Forced marriage itself is not a crime listed in the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court. Rather, it's prosecuted under the crime against humanity of other inhumane acts. Forced marriage is considered an inhumane act. It was defined by the trial judgment as the imposition against the will of the victim of duties that are associated with marriage 
and the consequent social stigma. Those subjected to forced marriage, they ended up having suffered from many different harms, physical and psychological harms, being forced into the status of wife, the duties expected of the victim, the attack on the victim's dignity, the depra deprivation of the victim's fundamental rights to choose a spouse, and to the extent that the forced marriage resulted in the birth of children, physical effects of pregnancy and child rearing, and also the very complex emotions and psychological effects of having to bear a child and raise a child in such a situ situation. Angwin is the very first person to be charged with the crime of forced marriage as a crime against humanity under the Rome Statute. And the prosecutor's decision to bring the charge is significant because it signifies an attempt to capture the fullest extent of the harm suffered by victims of the LRA. And charges of rape on their own or sexual slavery on their own just wouldn't do the same. The crime of forced marriage provides a wider lens through which we can examine the socioeconomic and sociocultural impacts of gender-based violations by the Lord's Resistance Army beyond the often narrow focus on physical harms associated with rape and sexual slavery. I wanted to mention also that Ong Wen is the first person charged with and convicted of forced pregnancy as a crime against humanity and a war crime under the Rome Statute. Angwen fathered 13 children with the seven wives I mentioned, but only three of the pregnancies were prosecuted because they fell within the specific time period that was being prosecuted. The fact that he was the father was proven at trial through DNA analysis. Forced pregnancy as a war crime and a crime against humanity is defined in this way in the statute. The unlawful confinement of a woman forcibly made pregnant with the intent of affecting the ethnic composition of any population or carrying out other grave violations of international law. The grave violations in this definition were reflected in his convictions for torture, rape, sexual slavery, enslavement, and outrages upon personal dignity. The trial chamber indicated that Ong Wen's wives and Ting Ting's lived in a highly coercive environment that was a microcosm of similar environments for girls in similar situations throughout the Lord's Resistance Army. This overt recognition of the aspects of a highly coercive environment is I believe really important. The trial chamber found that a coercive environment, this coercive environment was comprised of certain things. So for example, all seven women were distributed to a male commander. Once they were distributed to Dominic Angwen, they all joined his household and they were not allowed to leave. He placed them under heavy guard. They were told, or were, it was implied, that if they tried to escape, they would be killed. The seven were told that they had to maintain an exclusive conjugal and therefore sexual relationship with Dominic Angwen, and that if they trans get, transgressed this, they would be killed. They had to have sexual intercourse with him whenever he wanted. They had to bear his children, and they had to perform domestic chores and they had to follow orders to kill others. This was the coercive environment that Dominic Angwen put in place directly for his own household. Now these crimes have lifelong effects on the victims. The women and girls who were affected by this, who were forced into marriage by the LRA, face significant challenges once they escape, especially if they have children born out of forced marriages they have experienced pervasive discrimination, stigma, and rejection by their families. Now, I had mentioned that in addition to these convictions for what he directly did, Angwen was also convicted of a coordinated and methodical effort to commit sexual and gender-based crimes against women and girls in his brigade, the Sinead Brigade. He was convicted of helping to create 
and enforce an institution of forced marriage, torture, rape, sexual slavery, and enslavement, relying upon LRA soldiers under his command. What was really interesting about this case is that this was proven through radio intercept evidence, which showed the plans for forced marriage were the result of coordination among the LRA leadership, including, in, including Dominic Ongwen. So for example, Joseph Coney put in a standing order for the abduction of all pretty girls, as he put it, between the ages of 12 and 18 that the LRA soldiers came across in their raids of various encampments. And radio intercepts show that he rescinded that order at one point in time in 2003, which directly led to a drop in abductions of girls in that time period. And the trial chamber also found that during the time period of the indictment of the ICC, there were at least 100 abducted girls and women in the Sinia Brigade at all times. There was a system in place that was proven by the prosecutor for the distribution of the abduct abducted girls, which was overseen by Dominic Ongwen. There was a standardized approach for putting them under heavy guard, threatening them with death if they tried to escape, forcing them to beat or kill others, and making it clear to them that they had to submit to rape and other forms of enslavement. The explanation of this evidence was quite interesting because it actually looked a lot like the type of military evidence that's been reserved in the past for so-called gender neutral crimes, like um, when the prosecutor has in the past proven murder by military um, combatants or attacks on civilians by combatants. It's good to see, I think, that this sort of evidentiary pattern evidence is finally being brought to bear on sexual and gender-based violence. Now, I don't wanna leave you with the impression that the crimes I've outlined were the only crimes committed against women and girls. Sexual and gender-based violence is always part of a web of atrocities. Sometimes it's focused on by commentators and courts to the exclusion of all of these other interrelated crimes. Professor Liss is just about to tell you about another aspect of this web of interrelated crimes shortly. I'll end by reiterating that the Ongwen verdict is significant in terms of helping to advance accountability for sexual and gender-based violence crimes. It was the first at the ICC with such a broad spectrum addressing sexual and gender-based violence. It was the first time that the crime against humanity of forced marriage was charged as an other inhumane act and was prosecuted successfully before the ICC. It was the first time the crime of forced pregnancy was prosecuted before an international court, but it most certainly is not and should not be the last word on these types of crimes by the ICC. I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Professor Liss. Thanks very much, uh, Valerie, and thanks to Piper and the International Law Students Association for organizing this event. You've really done a great job. Um, and thanks to Professor Oosterveld for setting out uh, the context for the discussion today so, so helpfully. Um, and as you've heard, the ongoing case raises many important uh, questions for international criminal law. And the two that Professor Oosterveld and I are focusing on today are just a small segment of, of many that may come up in the questions as well. Um, so you've heard from Professor Oosterveld today about the new ground that the case breaks for uh, sexual and gender-based violence crimes at the International Criminal Court. Uh, and today I'm going to examine a difficult question that arises from Angwin's status as a former child soldier, which you've heard about already. Um, this question shows that the narrative that there's a clear divide between perpetrators and victims in international criminal law is often over oversimplified. And it requires us to consider how international criminal law should address the complicated reality of the experience that many individuals in conflict have as both wrongdoers and the target of wrongdoing. And in addressing this today, I'm going to make three points. First, I'll set out how we've traditionally ad addressed the liability of child soldiers and the liability for conscripting child soldiers uh, while uh, in the course of conflict. 
And second, I'm going to explain how Ongwin's role in the LRA in the Lord's Res Resistance Army began when he was forced to become a child soldier himself. And I'll consider what challenges this raises for his liability for the acts he committed as an adult. And finally, I'll set out uh, how the court addressed this issue. And I'll note the community, the affected community's response to the approach that the court ultimately adopted. So to start with my first point, the status and treatment of child soldiers under international criminal law. Now, the use of children as soldiers in conflict, whether they're forcibly abducted into the armed forces or they join voluntarily, has likely been a reality of conflict since time immemorial. But in recent decades, we've seen a persistent growth in the legal protection for children in contexts of conflict. So international humanitarian law or the laws of war has progressed over the last century from beginning to call that for those under 15 to be given special protections in the context of conflict, to calling on states to take all measures to avoid their participation in conflict, to outright prohibiting the use of children in conflict whether they're forced to join or they do so voluntarily. And most recently, and somewhat controversially at the time, those drafting the Rome Statute in 1998 made it a war crime to conscript or use child soldiers under the age of 15. And increasingly in other international legal obligations, we've seen the expansion of protection for children in conflict from those under 15 to those under 18. There are, in other words, uh, or there is, in other words, a growing global consensus that it's not only problematic, but in fact criminal to conscript or even use youth as soldiers. Minors, the reasoning goes, should be protected and excluded from participation in conflict. What's less clear is what we should do when minors are nevertheless forced to participate the con in conflict and then go on to break the law. What do we do when children who are illegally abducted into an armed force commit a war crime themselves or a crime against humanity? What do we do when these victims of an international crime victimize others? And there's no clear prohibition on trying soldiers for their child soldiers for their crimes. But international treaties obligate states to prioritize rehabilitation and demobilization. And notably, no modern international criminal tribunal has ever tried a child soldier for their crimes. In fact, the International Criminal Court and the ad hoc tribunals for the former Yugoslavia and Rwanda have limited their jurisdiction to the conduct of those uh, over 18. They do not, in other words, have jurisdiction over the conduct of those that were child soldiers at the time. The Special Court for Sierra Leone did include jurisdiction for those between the ages of 15 to 18, um, but they set special parameters for the trial of minors, calling for alternatives to criminal proceedings to be considered uh, where, where possible. And in fact, the first prosecutor of the Special Court declared that he would not try minors for international crimes. Child soldiers, in his view, did not have, quote, the mental capacity to commit mankind's most serious crimes. Instead, he stressed, quote, they were truly victims of cynical warlords and tyrants and thugs themselves. Okay, so now we have a sense of the legal status of children in the context of armed conflict. And this brings me to my second point today, Angwin's status as a former child soldier and the challenge that his case raises as a result. So Angwin grew up in Northern Uganda and he was abducted at age nine on his way to school and forced to join the Lord's Resistance Army as a child soldier. And the narrative that his, his lawyers and advocates for the case tell us is that he simply tried to survive as a young child. And as he did in school before the abduction, he said, they say he worked hard to win the praise of his elders. In this context, his entire universe of right and wrong was framed from the age of nine onwards by what he was told was right and wrong by the LRA. And meanwhile, the conflict in Northern Uganda went on and on and over time, Ongwen rose up through the ranks. 10 years after his abduction, while he was in his late teens, he was promoted to the rank of major. And a few years later, he was promoted to a command position in one of the LRA's four brigades. And it was at this time that Ongwen committed the war crimes and crimes against humanity that the ICC found him guilty of. And Ongwen argued that the fact that he had joined the LRA 
by force as a child soldier should excuse his criminal responsibility. Now, this was a context which international criminal law had not yet faced. States and policymakers have recognized that there are reasons and pol policy and principle to adjust our ordinary international criminal law framework for child soldiers. But the question was whether the same principles apply to those who enter an armed conflict as a child soldier and never leave. And child soldiers are best understood as victims, Ongwin's lawyers argued, and Ongwin's status as a former child soldier should place him under this paradigm. In the words of his lawyer, quote, once a victim, always a victim. And his lawyers argued that this status as a former child soldier should either negate his liability on its own or should be the basis for a defense of duress. So this brings me to my third and, and final point today. What did the court decide and what has been the community reaction to this outcome? So over the years that the case was tried, there was much debate about Angwin's status as a former child soldier in the popular media and in academic scholarship. Ultimately, however, the court viewed it as a simple issue. The pretrial chamber found that Angwin's status as a former child soldier, that, that Angwin's status as a former child soldier, uh, should the argument that it should inform his culpability was, quote, entirely without a legal basis, and declared that that chamber would not entertain it further. And when it got up to the trial chamber for the recent judgment, the trial chamber found that his abduction at a young age was not, quote, in and of itself a justification of any sort for the commission of similar crimes to others. And in this account, they included the fact that Angwin was responsible for the abduction, the conscription, and use of other child soldiers. And the chamber stressed that Angwin had committed the crimes of which he was found guilty when he was an adult. Instead of looking into the possible culp uh, reduction in culpability for his status as a child soldier, the court focused its analysis on the claim that this abduction and the conditions that followed it might give rise to defense of duress. But this too, they found, was unfounded. Over Angwin's 30 years in the, LRW, at the LRA, they observed he had had many opportunities to escape. And there's no indication that he'd face imminent death or imminent harm if he failed to carry out the crimes he was accused of. So Angwin's history as a child soldier did not change his liability when he carried out crimes as an adult. And this conclusion has ultimately faced a mixed response from communities in northern Uganda, where Angwin was from and where he carried out many of his crimes. According to reporting, two viewpoints have emerged. Many of those from Angwin's community and even some who were affected by the crimes themselves are conflicted. While they recognize that Angwin has committed brutal acts, they see Angwin ultimately as a victim of an abusive and ruthless non-state armed group. And they see him in addition as the victim of a government that failed to provide the infrastructure to protect him. Others, particularly those affected by Angwin's crimes, are happy to see accountability for the violations of international criminal law that he engaged in. They see him as a responsible party and no longer a minor. They, they see him as someone who was not simply carrying out the acts, the orders of a military structure that controlled him from a young age, but someone who had begun issuing those very orders himself and had taken agency in the structure and direction of the LRA. Okay, so to briefly conclude, the Angwin case raises a difficult question concerning the limits of international criminal law and ideas of agency. The law treats child soldiers as individuals with reduced culpability. And so the question arises whether the law should treat those who are forced to enter a conflict as a child soldier and remain in that conflict beyond the age of majority the same way. It's a question that the ICC ultimately did not find particularly difficult, despite conflicted feelings among the affected communities about which approach was the right one. And while Angwin's case might have been a novel one for the history of international criminal law thus far, it's far from an isolated phenomenon. Child soldiers continue to be used around the world today in the context of years long and decades long conflicts. And so undoubtedly, there'll be many other Angwins out there, many other individuals who are abducted in a conflict that goes on for years and years and reach the age of majority and conflict and commit crimes of their own. 
And it's fairly likely that the question of liability of adults who are forcibly abducted into an armed conflict as children will come up again before the ICC or before national courts trying international crimes. And so we'll see how this question progresses. We look forward to your questions. Thank you, Professors Osterveld and Liss. At this time, we're gonna open the floor up to any questions for our two panelists. Um, we ask that you use the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen, and those questions will then be posed to the panelists. So to begin the Q&A, we have a question from our pre-event Google Sheet, um, which can be answered by either or both of our panelists. And so it asks, could you comment on the length of the trial process at the ICC of 15 years from the time of the, of the arrest warrants? How do you believe this might have, been, might have impacted or hindered the administration of justice to the victims of the region? Do you want to take that or should I? Uh, feel free to take it first crack. Okay. So in the Angwen case, there was quite a long time between the issuance of the arrest warrants and his actual um, surrender. He surrendered himself to the International Criminal Court. I believe it was maybe 10 years or so. Is that, does that sound right? I, think um, that's right? I think it was 2014 and 2005 that the arrest warrant was issued. I yeah, think it was about 10 years. So that explains a large chunk of, of the time. And then the other aspect of it is while the International Criminal Court certainly can improve on its um, ability to speed up trials, international criminal trials are incredibly complicated and then the ICC itself has a complicated uh, procedural structure that takes time. And then Ong Gwen's case was affected by the um, impact, or at least the, the release of the judgment was, in, was impacted by the COVID um, shutdown of the court. So there are a number of factors in there as to why it took a very long time. Although I suspect that underlying the question is, could these trials happen more quickly? Um, and the answer is, once a person is in custody, yes, the trial could happen more quickly. And the ICC is always looking at ways to make that process more compact in terms of time. But what the ICC cannot control is how long it takes the person to come into custody from the time of the arrest warrant to, well, to be able to, because the ICC does not have its own police force. Do you wanna add anything? No, I, I, I think that's great. I, I mean, I think one other kind of aspect of uh, the, the timing or accessibility or, or uh, nature of these trials is the length of the trial judgment itself. Um, so sort of on the flip side of the many years that it took to actually uh, hear the case uh, is the fact that the trial judgment itself is well over uh, a thousand pages, um, which both contributes to the length of the actual case itself as judges and, and their clerks are processing these decisions and also reduces in some ways the accessibility of the judgments to uh, to the communities, to the queues, to others. Um, and this has been another aspect of, of debate over the years uh, for international criminal law. Thank you. So our next uh, question, again, is directed to both of our panelists. Um, so it is, could you comment on the length of the trial process at the ICC? Or sorry, my, my mistake, I, I um, am reading the one that I, Sam just read. I meant to say, can you comment on the government of Uganda's referral to, of the situation to the ICC? What are the other ways that the ICC can have jurisdiction over individuals who commit crimes against humanity? I, I can take the, the first crack of that. Uh, so yeah, so taking the second half of the question first, there's there's three modes that a, a case can come before the ICC. Um, it can be uh, referred by a state party, a, a state that is signed on to the Rome Statute, the treaty funding the ICC, founding the ICC. Uh, it can be initiated by the prosecutor herself um, if the case takes place within the jurisdiction. Uh, of a state party, or if it involves the nationals of a state party. Uh, 
uh, or it can be initiated by the UN Security Council. It can be referred by the UN Security Council, even if it concerns a situation um, that's outside the scope of those states that have signed on to the Rome Statute Treaty. Um, so the actual referral of this case by Uganda uh, was at the time uh, kind of a surprising one because when the structure was created to allow states to refer cases to the ICC, it was thought that one state would refer a situation that was happening in another state uh, to the court saying, you know, I'm, I'm concerned with what's happening in that other state. Um, but the Uganda case involved uh, the state referring conduct that was happening on its own territory to the ICC to look into. Um, and so there's been a lot of critique about this, uh, in particular, the ways in which it potentially has acted to insulate Ugandan state officials from the jurisdiction of the ICC, that because the cooperation of the court is based on uh, the willingness of the state to work with the court and the progress that the court has made on these cases is based on the willingness of the state to work with the court, uh, there's been critique that the prosecutor might be reluctant to look into the conduct of the Ugandan army itself and its involvement in many of these conflicts. I don't have anything to add, that was perfect. Excellent, so our next question is, when prosecuting these types of war crimes, what do you see as the biggest obstacle currently facing the ICC? Did this case address these obstacles or how might they be further addressed? I can speak, I can start um, by talking about the obstacles faced at the ICC in the prosecution of sexual and gender-based crimes. So the statute of the ICC, when it was adopted back in 1998, was at the time the most gender sensitive international criminal law statute that had ever been adopted. So the view was that the ICC would naturally be gender sensitive in terms of its investigations and prosecutions, but that didn't turn out to be the case. The prosecutor had investigated or had uh, charged, I should say, gender-based crimes from the beginning, but did not adequately staff the office of the prosecutor in a way with individuals who understood how to investigate in order to prove beyond a reasonable doubt the elements of crime for the sexual and gender-based crimes. So even though they were charged, what ended up happening over time is that the gender-based crimes in particular, amongst all of the crimes, the gender-based crimes ended up being the ones that got lost along the way. So either they were dropped or they were kicked out by the pretrial chamber in a, a specific process that the ICC has prior to going to trial, or the prosecutor was unsuccessful in proving these crimes at trial. And even when the prosecutor was successful, then they were overturned on appeal. So there was a very poor record of prosecuting these crimes because of the the um, the missteps of the office of the prosecutor, but and I should say that the prosecutor recognized this, and the current prosecutor uh, Fatou Bensouda then adopted a policy paper on how to approach the prosecution and investigation of sexual and gender-based violence. And after the implementation of that policy, things have improved, and the Angwan case is the outcome of that, as well as the Antiganda case that I mentioned earlier. But it's not only the prosecution that we need to look at. The judges have also misunderstood and allowed some rape myths to come in or um, misunderstood the elements of crime for sexual and gender-based violence. And that has also led to the attrition of these particular types of crimes in the, in the jurisprudence of the ICC. Thank you. So our next question is directed specifically towards Professor Liss. Um, that question is, do you feel that the background of Ongwen should impact the sentencing? Or as the judges said, that Ongwen has had the opportunity to leave, so it shouldn't have weight on the sentencing? Uh, 
Yeah, it, I think that's a great question. I see that there's two that kind of uh, track over that. Uh, Marie's question also uh, raises some questions about how we should best address the culpability of individuals in a position like Ongwin's. Um, and, and I think that addressing this at the stage of sentencing might be the most reasonable and logical place to think it through. Uh, to say that there's not necessarily a basis to say that you're not culpable, that you've got an excuse for your conduct by the fact that you were uh, you entered the conflict uh, as, as a child soldier. Um, but to say that there might be a mitigating factor that comes into play at the stage of sentencing to understand how we ought to punish someone who entered the conflict in those contexts. Um, and so, so I think that that goes to both the, the question that Marie and, and Nikki are, are raising here with respect to how we address these contexts and, and whether sentencing should come up. Okay, so our next question is for Professor Osterveld. For the evidence used through radio transmissions regarding sexual violence, do you know how that evidence was gathered and how do you believe that this will impact future trials? For example, do you believe prosecutors will find it easier to substantiate claims of sexual slavery? That's a really good question. So the, the radio, sept, radio intercept evidence was collected through radio intercepts that were done by the Ugandan um, army and also by other militaries, which were willing to turn over these intercepts to the International Criminal Court, which is, which is positive, um, because the International Criminal Court relies so heavily on cooperation by states and, and other entities in order for it to gather the evidence that it has, because as I mentioned, it does not have its own police force to do this. Um, why I found it so very interesting is because in the past, this type of evidence, radio intercepts, um, satellite imagery, this sort of thing, has usually been used to prove what are often referred to as gender neutral crimes or what uh, maybe I refer to it as gender neutral crimes, others just refer to them as regular crimes. And the ICC has been really reluctant to apply um, this sort of evidence to sexual and gender-based violence as if it was some other kind of category. And part of the problems with the prosecutor's office is that they, they had been um, losing or there had been so much attrition of sexual and gender-based crimes along the way because of the lack of solid evidence of sexual and gender-based violence brought to the court. They, in the past, the prosecutor, for example, had relied only on open, open source evidence and a few witnesses. But when you can undergird this sort of evidence with things like radio intercepts, it just really much more strongly uh, puts the case forward in terms of um, the judges evaluating whether that um, particular event um, and act had happened or not. The other part that's really interesting is in other sorts of crimes like attacks, uh, war crimes of um, attacking civilians and civilian objects, the International Criminal Court and other tribunals have used this sort of military evidence um, in a way that shows patterns and effects. And it was obvious to me a long time ago and to some others that they should be using similar evidence to show patterns and effects in terms of sexual and gender-based violence, which they finally are doing. And that's why I'm so excited that it's like the blinders have come off these crimes are different in many ways than other crimes, but they're also very similar uh, from other crimes. And because sexual and gender-based violence is always a part, as I mentioned, of a web of crimes, you can use all of this evidence to prove often uh, multiple things all at once, not just the sexual and gender-based violence crimes. So it's, a, it's exciting to see the sexual and gender-based violence crimes being properly situated in the evidence collection and, and uh, evidence put to the court. Oh, there was another part about what this means for future courts. Is, am I right, Sam? Uh, what this means for future courts, I think, is this is an example of best practices. And this can help show other courts what to do, what the way in which they can conduct their investigations according to best practices. Um, I. I wouldn't have said that about the ICC like even five years ago. You wouldn't want to follow what the ICC did. That was not best practice, but this is best practice. Uh, 
So how likely would it be that the ICC changes their position on diminished culpability for former child so soldiers who commit crimes once they are adults? Yeah, so, so this is a great point. And, and I see that sort of another half of the question is the structure of precedence of the ICC and how that works. Um, and so would, would the court end up changing its position or is it bound by its former precedent? Um, and so there's, there's two pieces to this. One is that right now we only have the trial judgment in the ongoing case. Um, and there's the possibility of appeal, which remains outstanding. Um, and so it might very well be that the appellate chamber themselves um, will overturn this decision and, and approach it anew. Um, and if this issue doesn't actually get up to the appeals chamber, if it's not addressed at that level, it's very possible that another trial chamber um, will take a different approach. But generally, there's not sort of a strict common law binding or nature of binding precedent on the ICC. Um, and so there's you know, a greater uh, opportunity uh, or greater space for a precedent to change over time for the approach to these issues to change over time um, if the argument is put forward in, in a way that the, the court finds more compelling. Um, that being said, I, I think that there, there might be something um, that we should, uh, something that, that probably we'll see the court coming back to in the, in the logic of the ongoing case in approaching these issues. We might see future cases at least taking the argument a bit more seriously and offering a bit more of a fulsome uh, explanation for why they don't think that there's a diminished culpability for child soldiers. Um, but I think the conclusion will likely be the same. So Professor Osterveld, a similar kind of precedent question. Do you think the ICC's progressive recognition of gender-based violence like forced marriage can influence other international criminal tribunals or courts? If so, how can this be done in view of the fragmentation of international law and the lack of hierarchy of international courts? That's an excellent question. So the way that I think of this is that on sexual and gender-based violence in, and forced marriage is a really good example of this, courts are in conversation with each other. So of course there's no precedent between the ICC and the Cambodia Tribu Tribunal, for example, or the Special Court for Sierra Leone and the International Criminal Court, but they use jurisprudence from each other. And I think that's going to continue for other tribunals. The, the other tribunals will use ICC jurisprudence and the ICC will look at other tribunals jurisprudence if it's on a, especially if it's on a novel issue. So for example, in, in this particular case, Angwen, forced marriage was a novel issue in that forced marriage had not been charged before at the International Criminal Court, but it had been charged before at the extraordinary chambers in the courts of Cambodia and the special court for Sierra Leone. So what the ICC did, more so when it was looking at this at the first stage of examining the charges called the confirmation of charges stage, it the ICC looked quite carefully at the jurisprudence of these other two tribunals in order to figure out if it needs to, it, how it can inform the ICC. Does the ICC need to take a different approach or can it take a similar approach? It would never, uh, it's not forced to take a, the same approach. It can always take a different approach. In the end, it actually did take a similar approach to the special court for Sierra Leone, although adapted it to the Ugandan situation um, in order to, uh, it's, it's a similar approach, but just using some different wording around what the word marriage means. So the special court for Sierra Leone never did clearly articulate why this word forced marriage, these words forced marriage um, are the best words to use to explain the other inhumane act that was charged as a crime against humanity and, and as a war crime. And in the Angwen case, they took time to explain that the use of the word wives uh, by the Lord's Resistance Army was intentional. It was a way to enslave um, the women under this created institution so that they could have basically an economy of um, caregivers, of sexual slaves, and of domestic slaves. 
through terminology and without without it having to actually be a marriage under Ugandan law. And I thought that was quite interesting. And it's like taking this conversation with the special courts jurisprudence and taking it one step further to to expand or to uh, further develop international criminal law in this respect. And future tribunals will do the same. It, they'll probably take the jurisprudence on forced pregnancy and then take it one step further in order to explain how it fits in that particular fact scenario. Thank you. So our next question is, um, what impacts do you foresee that this conviction will have on future proceedings of similar issues that reach the ICC and as a whole, the impacts on the presence or state of rebel groups such as the LR? A. So I, I can offer some initial thoughts, and I, I'm sure that Professor Stavella will have uh, some additional ideas as well. Um, one one thing that stands out to me is we we heard earlier in the remarks that there were uh, some cases at the ICC earlier on where um, building the evidence base, uh, proceeding sort of in a methodical way, and actually proving the case. Uh, was not as was not perceived in, in, in as rigorous a fashion. And we've seen in, in recent cases like the Angwin case, like the Ntanganda case, um, a much more robust evidence base, uh, more counts than were put forward in the prior cases actually both uh, forwarded and proven. Um, and so I think that this might be the, the mark of or a continued pattern of sort of improving the actual efforts to prove the cases going forward uh, and learning lessons from some of the struggles in, in the early cases. So I think this is kind of a, a continued pattern of, of steps towards more, more rigorous uh, processes in improving the cases. Um, in terms of uh, its effect on, on rebel groups and LRA, um, so with respect to rebel groups generally, uh, the debate uh, on the effect that international criminal law has uh, as a deterrent for international non-state groups has has been uh, really uh, um, uh, controversial. And there, there's many different views. There's been some empirical evidence recently that it does have some effect, that these cases do have some effect as, as deterrents on some non-state rebel groups out there. Um, especially those that are seeking legitimacy, those that are seeking to take power in the state. And so there might be sort of the knock-on effect of that. For the LRWA specific, the LRA specifically, I'm infused with the, the research culture of Western here. For LRA uh, specifically, uh, we, we heard in, in Piper's introductory remarks, helpfully, the impact that uh, Ongwin's uh, 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 Angwin leaving the, the, the actual LRA itself has had on sort of the diminished uh, strength, the diminished cap capacity of the force. Um, and so it may not be the case, but sort of where the force stands right now, um, that, that might have more of an influence on, on, its, on its future and the fact that it might actually be uh, crumbling under pressure. Uh, I leave it to Professor Stavell to, to add to that. I think that. I think that was great. I don't have anything to add. So with that, I think we're out of time. On behalf of the International Law Association and the Public and Private International Law Research Group, we wanted to take a minute to thank our lovely panelists, Professor Osterveld and Liss, for being with us here today. I think I speak on behalf of any, everyone in saying that we learned a lot and appreciate your candid insights. Prior to ending this event, the International Law Association would just like to draw everyone's attention to another event we'll be holding next Friday from 3 to 4 p.m where Professor Link will be discussing careers in international law and specifically his appointment to the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the situation of human rights in the Palestinian territories. For further information, this can be found on our Facebook group. And if you have any questions, feel free to meet, reach out to any of the members of ILA. So with that, we wanna thank everybody for coming and we wish you a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you, bye. Thanks very much, bye.